whatever spheres that you could be uh, working on, it is important to have some definite goals. Yeah, just to reiterate that whether it's spiritual, whether it is uh, whatever we're going to, uh, whatever journeys we are embarking on in life, uh, Jude 1 verses 20 reminds us that. But I read, I think let me just take it also from the, just want to take it up so that you can also read. Um, just a moment as I share the screen. Sorry. I think. Uh, Dr. Ayua, if you are there, you can enable us to share. the moment Thank you, Dr. Ari. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, just as I was trying to explain, just uh, from the book of Jude 1, 2021, 20, but you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Wait for mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So things about things you were looking forward to, I mean, in terms of our journeys of faith, we are saying that we need to build ourselves up for the things that are ahead, which is basically the eternal life. So this is, uh, although it's about faith and others and, and, and the related and the journey that we do make, we are, we are encouraged to build ourselves so that we can be able to get to that uh, promise, which is eternal life. And that, if you if if you have the time, please you can go uh, through the entire passage, the entire chapter. But the idea is that we need to be reminded to um, have definite goals in life. In this case, our goal is eternal life. But of course, as we look at what we we are doing in different every day in life, we make different things. We journey together. We try to to get to different points each and every day as uh, so you're encouraged to always be be in in sync with god's plan which is all about progress make sure that we are advancing in every sphere of our lives we are making the right uh, we are making the right steps moving forward you have some definite goals in life and uh, for you to be able to have some definite goals then uh, we should be able to measure progress as you go along and in my thinking, even as we are engaging in this unit, I'm sure we we'll, you should be able to measure progress at the end of every session we're having. A number of us have different views of statistics, but it's it's upon us to reflect and say that, well, after each and every class, have you learned anything? As, as you increased in knowledge, um, is it something that you can take it up even beyond what we do in class? So that you are moving to the next level. So have clear cut, uh, clear cut goals in every uh, journey, as even as you begin the year. You know, make sure that those are well articulated and and you already are able to conceive, even at the end of 2024. And importantly, at the end of this unit, as you reflect on the journeys that are that you've already made and the ones that are ahead of you, I want to encourage you to keep going. And uh, make sure, indeed, that you're able to measure progress at every stage, because you should. We should look forward, build yourself to that most high place that you are seeking at the end of it all. But 
Of course, the Holy Spirit is what you are is that which you are seeking for guidance, for presence, and uh, for deliverance as you move from one step in life to the next. So just to encourage you, keep going. It is never, it's never too late, it's never too early. Let's just keep going. Now, good. So having having said that, I'd like to I think I would request one of us to open the session of prayer. A volunteer, if not, I can nominate somebody. Even as you reflect on the goal for the day, Jimmy is right there. Okay, good evening, Dr. Ari. Good evening to you. Okay, let us pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, uh, we bless you and we give you glory. Thank you, King of Kings, for your preservation. Thank you for loving us with your everlasting love. And your word says that you've chosen us not because we've chosen you. You have loved us, not because we've loved you. But it is by your grace and by your mercy that, Lord, we have actually loved us and even preserved our lives and even bring us to this far. Indeed, Lord, we might have gone through ups and downs in life, but we thank you because we have not been destroyed. We can still attest to your goodness and to your faithfulness, and indeed we can say that you are a faithful God. We thank you because of this program and even this class, when as we study statistics through uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Laban, Father and our God, we pray that, Lord, you may help us even to grasp the content so that, Lord Almighty, by the end of everything, when all is said and done, we'll be able to be to attest to the fact that, Lord, our lives have improved, our practices are different as, our, uh, uh, as far as our careers are concerned, uh, we shall be able to depict and even uh, attest to the fact that our lives have been transformed through uh, the teachings and the various lessons that we are learning in this program. We pray that, Lord, we shall not remain the same, even at the place of work, even in our families, even wherever we minister, even at the church levels and wherever we serve, even as leaders or as workers. We are trusting that, Lord Almighty, will be able to uh, bring that change out from uh, out in us. Thank you because of each one of us. Father, I remember even the ones who have not been enabled even to attend to this class. Father, you know, and we ours is to pray for them as we seek and ask you to meet them at their point of need. The sick and the ones of Father who are not who are in convenience in one way or another. Father, we pray that you may remember them. Thank you because of the entire staff of Daystar University, including even our tutors, even for this semester. Father, we pray for them as we ask you, Lord Almighty, to give us uh, the strength, because we know that apart from you, Lord Jesus, we can do nothing. Thank you, Lord, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for the prayers. You've prayed for everyone. We are now on it. All right. So uh, statistics has been statistics, and it remains so. And so in this next phase, we are making progress, picking up from what we had done last week. I encourage you, if um, there will be things that we shall do manually, there are things that I will be referring you to the Excel the, and the like, because in the end, we shall be talking of numbers throughout. Yeah, so think about that. And uh, even as we reflect on what we had done last week, just want to pick up from the slides. So please know that uh, right now we're dealing with um, we're dealing with a, one of the very basic yet important topics, which is uh, talking about numbers and how to summarize data using the numbers. And I can for sure uh, remind us that we had done uh, um, the, the 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 most important measure of central tendency, which is simply the average or the mean. But uh, today, we may not really focus a lot on the more than the others, but at some point, we will talk about the median, uh, which is also very important at, at, in some instances. But I gave a lot of emphasis to the arithmetic and weighted mean, because it gives us some meaning to the data that we do have. Uh, later, we shall talk about the other ones on the right-hand side, which is the measures of variance or the measure of, measures of spread. Hopefully we can rec 
record. I don't, I don't know if it's recorded. I hope so. Yes, on YouTube, it is being recorded. I can see. It's being recorded. Good. Thank you. Right. So the measures on the right hand side, we shall also talk about them because they also have important implications in assessing data as well. So ours is to understand the theory behind each of them, the context in which you, it, they are applied, and importantly, how to uh, even uh, generate those numbers, and finally, interpret. So when you talk about the variance, uh, standard deviation, coefficient of variation, we shall be giving meaning to them. So if I remember exactly, we had done uh, the basics about I gave more weight to the weighted mean because it has more relevance. Reason is because in most cases, we tend to uh, group the data or you tend to have data which have different weights in, in your research or in a given uh, data set. And I think we are all aware and now we know how to compute the cumulative uh, grade point average for our grading. And so it was, it was, it's my wish that, and also hope that you did revisit the question that we, I asked you to complete to the extent that you're able now to compute the cumulative GPA. Um, I will make a mention of the fact that it is also important to consider the average also in assessing the performance of different stock and investment options. And so you can make decisions based on a simple average. Uh, Leading to the group data, we we created frequencies last week, and so from the uh, crew, uh, from the frequencies created, you can now then even look for ways in which you can generate those averages and the rest. Um, this example we covered together. Um, we are able to talk about those numbers. This was a, a, a an example of the grading system that uh, we had uh, proposed. And we walked through the cumulative, the, 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 the term GPA for this student who is an accounting student doing all, all those units. I remember in the next slide, uh, that particular computation was done. So this is, we got an average GPA of 2.86 if I, if I remember quite correctly. Uh, just a moment, I think uh, this is bio two, three. I think they have, everything else looks okay in terms of the computations. Now, I had asked you to compute the cumulative GPA. I don't know, I don't know if you are able to do that. I think this was the question I, I threw to you. That uh, from this question, we did together the first part. Yes, come again. Sorry. Okay. If you just mind, if you don't mind, you just go back to the previous one. There. Yeah. Mm hmm. Tell me. If uh, I look at the credit hours. Yes. The credit hours of uh, of uh, B B U S two eleven two Number one five. one. All right, this one. Eh? Yes, it is three. Uh -huh. And then I think here it is the same three. Oh yes, yeah. see this is correct. This these two here. Mm is the is is the point is the point for 58 the points that are associated with the 58 or a c stand so someone getting a c stand gives a point of two two points just from the screen from the grading scale if i take you back to the previous slide this one this 56 to 50 to 60 is a c stand giving a total point of two and I think uh, that is where we have that two here. Mm. And then the weight is three, giving us six. I, I, I think it is clear now. I, I don't know whether it was you that had asked me that last week. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can. I, 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 think it's I don't okay. think it's one. 
Maybe this yes. one. The other one. All right. For which one? The second, the second example. Oh, the second example. Yeah. Let me check whether this one. Oh. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, this one. Ah, oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Here, right? Yes. Yeah, correct. Yeah, I think we can adjust that. This was, this is supposed to be three. three. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Ah, good. I think I, fine. So that should give you 9.9 .9 here. Yeah. Uh, I think on that note, then you are right. You are, we, we are okay. So I think this, this is a small error that we can adjust because this is a two. This is a two while it's supposed to be three here. Yeah. Three. Yeah, that's okay. Any Osanya want to say something? Good evening, Dr. Good evening to you. Uh, mine is a question on uh, how did how 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 do you determine the grade points? Using which criteria were were the grade points determined or obtained? This, this is a this is institutional and it is given. For example, what we have here. You should have this is this is the given information that the criteria for grading is on this scale. So you cannot do weighted for weighted GPA if you don't have this scale. And there are weights like that. So even for your grading, I, uh, we adopted this uh, GPA system, which is a scale of zero to four. So are they just random values, Dr. Not necessarily. You see, this is um this this scale is for data most most institutions which use gpa works on this scaling it is like um, i know most of us are coming from the a b c d f like that eh? but that was the that was the other scale but yeah come again that is true you know we are wondering that mm. uh, we, when I was in Egypt, on there was nothing like A minus, B minus. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> <American B>. system. <laughs> <laughs> now this you will get from America. <laughs> yeah, this is the American system of grading. Yeah, and so expect these grades. It's good you you came to this class. At least you 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 learn a different system of grading as well. Most institutions which use GPA system have this kind of grading and there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> it's okay now let's move on to i don't know there are some two and there are one person cindy yes doctor could you please uh, project your answer for the example two was that the term gpa that you told her to calculate now it's gonna change because of this number oh. here Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I was wondering because I got 3.18. Yeah, it's going to increase because this was a typo here. It's a mistake here because this would be 9.9. .9. So it should be. Yeah, 3. I got 3.8 and then, and then cumulative GPA 3.02. 3.02. Let, let, yeah. let me get the answer for, let me get a sample answer to this for, what did you get here, um, Cindy, 3.18? I got 3.18 because the 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 accumulation was 44.5 then divided by 14 that was the term gpa good 3.18 correct now let's me let me get a second person that had the same answer i did I, correct I did. now i also did uh, great so let's let's then agree and say this is going to be 3.18 then what we will do now is we will take the 40, you say 44.5, which is this one. You, this is 44.8, according to what, 44.5, according to what you've told me, you can then substitute in here. What will be the cumulative? As Cindy, again. I, I got 3.0. 3 3.0 0 .0 flat, 0 0.1, good. Yeah. Thank you. Fine. I think that is sorted. I got, I got 3.02, which is a very small difference. Yeah, small difference. Usually, it's, uh, to the round, we round it to two decimal points. So we are in the neighborhood of 3.01 yeah. as a cumulative. 
Right, I think we are good on that question. I want we can then move to another uh, segment, uh, hoping that there is no other raised hand, although I'm seeing Orsanya. Anything? Is... It's well, Doctor, it's OK. OK, we can then proceed. I hope there's no other hand which is raised. Yeah, Excuse you can me, Dr. Ali. Yes, please. There was that other question of getting the class reference mark. Question three. That I was unable to calculate. This question three? Yes. All right. Good. Let's let 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 to be let this be the one that we shall do together when we do the variance in the next sec section. So we'll we will work with this question. As you do the average mark, we'll also do the standard deviation and variance. Thank you. I think that was in my plan so that we can also address what we had gotten in this particular case. So this will be partly a manual process of doing it. And uh, yeah, so that's fine. Okay, let me then oh. take, let's, let's, let's then, hopefully you are able to also look at this second example, which I have also projected in this uh, particular slide. At times you'd also want to assess the extent to which uh, the average returns for different stocks can vary. So in this example too, you are told that uh, consider in, uh, you are considering investing in two stocks at the NSC and your financial advisor provides you with data from past records of the average quarterly stock price increases based on annual financial circles and trends in the market. He also provides you with the probabilities associated with each stock. The data is summarized as such. So we have on average through the, through the four quarters, the price change is given by those ones each and every quarter, depending on the seasons and cycles of the year. And this do happen with some probability. So by the time the year ends, the, we'll have a sense that we have a complete probability set. If you sum 0 0.24, 0 plus 0.3, plus 0.26, plus 0.2, that should give you an, a total of one, which is the total probability. So this is, this is a case in which you can be able to assess and see whether on average which of these stocks will be would give you a, a better return and so you can utilize the concept of a weighted average to determine which of the two will work better for you and so uh allow me not to uh, explain the process and the, and the little beauties of uh, the steps but you could see it from the next slide the workings on this because you just apply the same procedure by saying that the average will be equal to the total. Simply, we will be assessing for Jubilee Holdings first by multiplying the 6% times associated probability. And then you do the same for the all the quarters. And then later on, you sum them together. You repeat the process for Kakuzi, which is also multiplying the price change, divide, uh, multiplied by the probability of that price change happening. And then later on, you sum the you sum the two, and then from there you can now compare which of these stocks is preferable, just on the basis on the base based on simple averages, and I think that is quite in order. So in the next slide, I have provided the answer. Um, sorry, we'll not be able to walk through this together because I think it is straightforward. All we are asking is what is the average increase in price for Jubilee Holdings. And then what is the average increase in price for Kakuzi for the entire one year? And so you can use the weighted averages. The weights now becomes the probabilities of each of these events happening. And so in the next slide, what you will be doing is simply to compare the two. So I have the same question repeated. What I've done is simply to um, multiply the price times the probability you get for Jubilee, 1.44. 9 times 0.3, you get 2.7. 10.5 times 0 0.26, you get 2.73. Finally, 2% 2 times 0 0.2, you get 0 0.4. Total, 7.27. And because it's weighted average, I should now divide this total by the total uh, weights. 
the total weight is one, which is the probability. So 7.27 divided by one, I get now the weighted means of 7.27 right here. As you can see, the formula is same as what you have seen, meaning you sum the products of the weights and the observations, and you get that. We repeat the same process for this other uh, stock, which is the Kakuzi one. You find that on average, this is um, 2.16, which is simply 12 times 0.18, 7 times 0.32, you get 2.24. The last one near 5% times 0.24, you get 1.2. Total 7.16. So the weighted average is 7.16 divided by the total weight, which is still also 1 at this end. So the average price is 7.16. So on the basis of uh, the averages or the weighted average, you can be able to say on average, it seems Jubilee Holdings shares gives me a, a higher return compared to that of Kakuzi. And so a rational human being would indeed choose this one. This is what it is. I would like you to note one thing, the importance of weights. When you assign weights to observations, it gives a deeper meaning compared to when you just assume that everything is the same. For instance, if I was to do simple average, this is what you call the arithmetic mean. If I say 6 plus 9 plus 10.5 plus 2, and then you divide by the four cases, you get 6.88. So I said the arithmetic mean is 6.88 for this one. If I do the average for this 12, 7, blah, blah, up to, up to 5, the average is 5. So if you are looking at a very basic mean, you could simply say, I, I, I get an av a high average for this one compared to this one. And so you are likely to make a wrong decision because you've assumed that each and every quarter weighs the same. So this is why these weights serve as a better means of making decisions on the basis of average. Well, so I, want I wanted to ask a question. Yes. Yeah, where these weights come from and what considerations are made to mm. make some weightier than the others? So this question, it is because of, um, if you look at the question that this is a financial analyst that has considered records from the past. Yeah, information that comes from past, the market behaviors and the like. So this is from the financial analyst that from previous examinations, there's always every quarter, there's an associated change because of the different seasons and trends that happen. So in a nutshell, the weights, you may not necessarily uh, determine, but you must know them. You must be able to know that so that you can now associate these different changes on average. So I want to say that from the question given, um, the analyst has made their own assessment and just provides, provided you with data to just give you a scenario, uh, what happens on the ground. And so it's upon you now as, a, as, a, as an investor to decide. So this is just a scenario as I was as, as, as presented in this question. Okay. Dr. sorry. Yes, please. Come again. I'm realizing on your slide for providing solution, 6% of uh, 0 0.24, you're giving us 1.11. What happens? Because I thought you're supposed to multiply 6 over 100, or because it's a constant throughout, we, you have ignored that bit. Yeah, we've ignored that bit, eh? because the assumption in this data is that uh, you, you the measures are in percentages already. So no. you can as well even do with, even if you do uh, six of a hundred, you will still arrive at a similar conclusion. It will just be a, this is some two decimals before or behind. It will not change the outcome. For example, here, you are likely to end up with 0 0.0727, something like that. But it will not change your final conclusion. So feel free to use whichever. I've just decided to use the numbers the way they are as reported. Because at the end of it all, I'm also consistent with the interpretation. I'm still referring to percentage at the end of it all. Good question.
and I think that is clear. Just want to also note um, the other area that we use this uh, weighted mean a lot, even for your for your assess for your assessments for the for the units you are taking. Uh, you do record your cut marks. You know you have different activity assessment item. And then you have your weight. So you have an assignment. You have some group work. You have some online quiz. I have a presentation. And then at the last one, I have a final exam. So most of you do this as if you are in the teaching profession. This is what we often do so that I can say my uh, this one carries 20 percent, 20 percent, 20 percent, maybe 10 percent. And the, the final one gives you the last maybe 30 percent. And that's what it is. So so if these are your weights in percentage form. So so all your exams and your, your weights will now be based on this weight, so that at the end of it all, we have talked about 100% in terms of the sum. So the application of this does not just cut across what I have just given to you, even for normal uh, assessments. So you can imagine if, if you had um, different activities, it could have been good if I had varied this uh, particular weightage. Yeah, so it could have been better if I gave different weights so that it can make more sense. So for example, this one can give 30, maybe 25. And then perhaps this other one can be given 15. Something like that. So that you know where you want to put more effort in. At the end of it all, the weights should match at the end of it all. So whether you mark any, whether we assign you a size assignment out of 50, this other one out of 20, the other one out of 100, out of 200, whatever, whatever mark the exam or whatever is marked on, the weights are the ones that will now uh, give you different uh, measures at every level. And to me, this gives you a fair representation of who the student is. So the weighting is important. It gives you weighted averages and weighted means. So it's the same concept as the one for the GPA, GPA system. Otherwise, if everything was just the same, um, then we would have a situation where we have five items, one, two, three, four, five, and you give a uniform weight of 20% each. So if I did 20% across the board, it means that I'm, I'm actually doing what is called an arithmetic mean, because you are weighting every item the same way. But you know that the effort that you put in each of these items may not be the same, and the importance of the same in the entire is also different. And so weighted averages play a critical role in that manner. Good. I think uh, I'll, at some point I'll talk about the median and the others in the next segment that we do today under variances and standard deviations and other measures of dispersion. But basically at some point it might be of use in some cases to just locate the middle value in any particular data set because it can help you to also give you a certain measure. So try to identify, you know, we are dealing with measures of location. We are asking which is the middlemost value in the data set. So it may not have a very strong meaning or other relevance like the me, the average, but it has its own way of uh, identifying certain elements that can describe the data. This can be very useful when you have outliers. Yeah, outliers are simply extreme values. So remember the average, the mean is affected by extreme values. When you have very different values from the others, then a mean will be a bit biased. The mean will be leaning towards where the extreme value is. But should you want to maybe have a rough idea of where the, where the I mean, a, a better way of describing that data, the median can be of importance. 
ideally what happens is uh, you're looking at the where we have the where the center of the data actually so it means that you may have a way of which you sort the data first in ascending or a descending order whichever order you want then you try to locate the average the, the middle point so we'll not dwell a lot with these mechanics of the median and even the mode uh, but as long as you're able to get the mean, I think the mean is more powerful. It gives you more, it gives you better meaning and interpretation. But I'm not downgrading the importance of the median. But the median helps you when you're looking at distributions. You know, how far is how far is an observation from the mean and the like? Allow me to just mention the concept of the thing. The mode is very straight, is standard. It's very straightforward. The, the the difference between the importance of the mean, median, and the mode is that the mode has a different way of looking at things. It helps you not just to come around the problem of uh, outliers or extreme values, but it is also useful when you have data which is at any level of measurement. Whether you have nominal, for example, color, race, gender, whatever, if, you are, if it's ordinal, that is about uh, Likert scales, for instance, or uh, interval, the age in years, the temperatures in degrees Celsius and the rest, or even ratios in exchange rate between the dollar and the, and the Kenyan shilling, so which includes ratios and the rest. So the mode will be a better descriptor of all that, particularly when you have nominal data, which is, which is not what you see in the mean and the more and the median but why we why i mentioned the two mode median it's because of the next slide so we shall not at this stage uh, look at the mechanics of the mean the median and the mode for now but i brought it because i wanted us to talk about something referred to as a distribution distribution of a data set so by distribution we talk about the shape in relation to the three measures. We are comparing the three measures of location and try to position them in a given data set. Where do they learn? Where do they lie, sorry? Where do they lay in the entire range? Which one is higher than the other? It helps you to have an idea of the distribution of the data set. So in a nutshell, I know you've heard of uh, positively skewed data, negatively skewed data, normal distributed, Ideally, it's because of the three measures being compared. When you compare the three, it can give you an indication as to whether you have skewed the data to what extent. And especially the, particularly the median. The median plays a very, very critical role because the median is the center. When, when, the, when you have the data set and you have looked at the center of the data set, then you can now talk about the center in relation to the mean. Is the mean to the left or to the left or, or to the right or are the, they are together? So ideally when you mean and median are equal, forget even about the mode, then you are likely to have a distribution which is normal. Just for the record, or what I mean by normal distribution, everyone knows that kind of a uh, shape where nearly actually half of this half, half of the data set is on one half and then the rest ha or the rest of it are on the other half and the bell we have this bell shape which is which shows that we have symmetry the keyword there is symmetry the symmetry is visible yeah, because one, if I split this into two, then I will have two equal halves. So that is a normal distribution. But if your data, if now you bring a difference, or if the data set has a different mean and mode, then you are now able to say, do we have a skew, do we have a positively skewed data or negatively skewed data? So this is important. Why, why we care about distribution is because of what we'll be dealing with in the next upcoming this thing of hypothesis testing when you are testing hypothesis 
it is important to understand whether you're dealing with a distribution which is normal or not. So it will be clearer when that time comes. Let me just look at, if you look at slide number 23, now it becomes clearer. So depending on the positioning of the median, you can determine whether there is symmetry or lack of it in the data set. For instance, I want us to focus on the, the middle one, the one at the middle, at the center. So this one tells you that uh, if the mean and the medium are equal, then there's symmetry. However, if the median deviates from the mean in any order, then you can either have a negatively skewed data or positively skewed. So typically, when you have a negatively skewed data, it means that the tail, the tail is on the to us on to your left, left skewed. When your tail is further to the right, we call that positively skewed data. And these two data sets it will imply that you will not be able to use certain hypothesis testing techniques for this kind of data, because it it may not necessarily fit the normal distribution. So I think it makes sense that this concept of a median helps you to locate actually the, the nature of the distribution we're dealing with. Finally, as we well, come up. Just, just, uh, yeah. just a question with the Correct. statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's also good then we, we localize so that then the examples you're giving can help us understand. When yes. talking about the negative as uh, negative skewed, correct. Could we, could we relate it with say the KCSE results that emerged, where we had a majority of the students uh, getting um, uh, very low grades, and then just a small portion getting very high grades, like uh, only one thousand getting A's, for example. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had a uh, majority of them, I mean, 48,000 is, for example, we Correct. had uh, over 500,000 uh, below mm -hmm. D plus, you know, that kind of a thing. Is that is, that's what is called the negatively skewed. I think it is the other way around. Yeah. The positively skewed. Assuming, as it depends on what, where, where, where you are, your tail is, eh? If you if you look at a case where you have very few passes, my, my my X is moving towards the highest from the lowest. Yes. Ah, yeah. nice. Let me draw a better one here then. Okay. So, the so, way yeah. we let's uh, let's have it this way. Suppose these are your your grades or uh, performance of the high school uh, in terms of percentage. So the highest out there, sorry, we have on the just a moment, just want to move this. Just a second, sorry. Okay, there we go. So further to the right, I want, let's talk for a case where you, you have 100% there, and then the 0%, those who have failed. And the pass mark, let's have a, a, even an average of 50. So if there is um, if if there are very few uh, students who have passed in the final examination, so I'm expecting few cases here, and then we have the majority around there. Assuming there is an overall failure in the in the in the in the in the country. When you have many people failing, it means that majority of the data will be around here, around the 30, 40, and the, and the rest. A few are likely to pass with the A's and the rest, 80 and going to the 90, 90%, 80%, and the rest. So what that means is that if you have general failure in the, in the country, it suggests to us that... Uh, a majority of the data will be skewed to this other side. It means that they will be available, or rather most of them will be around here. So if I'm to fit a rough idea of what that means is you have something like that. So suggesting, 
just do a better one. Yeah, something like that. Suggesting to us that we have a you have what you call a positively skewed, positively skewed. Um, that's why I asked the question, Malimo. That is very good. What what in positively fact, I, skewed? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. In fact, your question is, is very good because it has helped us to understand these things called distribution. You are able to now see it better, and even. Uh, in any other variable, we just speak on performance. And if you are a, a teacher, it's good to understand at the end of the term or at the end of the year, how have your students fared? Even as you look at the total, you look at the few uh, classes, per class and the rest. So here, what that tells you is that um, the average, the average is likely to be if that means that you can have maybe the average here this is your mean and then the middle most value will be somewhere here median we have a few extreme cases further to the right so those few exceptional cases forms where the skew will be you consider the tail the tail is further to the right. So we call this one positively skewed data. So before I proceed, I saw someone's hand up. Was it Gaki? Please. Yes, Doctor. I was you. trying to figure out why would we actually say it's positively skewed, yet what we can say is most of the students failed. Mm -hmm. Is it just a definition of what this is in terms of statistics? Yeah. Skew, thank you. Good question. Skewness is interpreted in terms of these very different cases. You know, you can see the majority seems to be around here, but we have a few, a few outliers who are pulling the distribution to the right. So we call this one skewed to the right or positively skewed because we have a few exceptional cases which is pulling the other in a different direction. And I think that is the idea behind positive and negatively skewed. Have I answered? Yes, Dr. I would appreciate if you also gave us an, an ideal example, just as you've done this way, for mm. negatively skewed. It's, it's a, this one is clear, but I would also want to see if the negative yes. one in, in a setup. Thank you. Mm. OK, you can as well also consider um, even even if you are looking at the stock prices. Sorry, sorry. Yes, Osanya. Just back on the diagram you've drawn. Correct. Up here. I'm going to go up right now. I don't know. Did I get it right? You said when it is supposed to be skewed, the mean is greater than the median. Eh? No, no, the median is greater than the mean. Oh, I not I not picked that correctly. Thank you. Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. what? Did, oh, come again. Can you repeat your question again? You had indicated that when uh, the distribution is positively skewed, eh? okay, the mean is greater than the median. I think I maybe uh, I didn't get it right. I think you're right. Thank you. Thank you. I think you 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 are right. Actually, for for positively oh, skewed, I'm, I'm confused then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think you 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 got it right. That's when on the diagram, where is the mean and where is the median? Yeah, that's why I'm now saying that I need to adjust that. And it's good you've picked it out. Eh? It is actually the other way around. Thank you. Sorry for the slight miss up there. Yeah, so this actually should be your median. And the other one should be your mean. Because when you see that now the on average, we have a few cases which are pulling the data in one direction because ex uh, the, the outliers tend to affect the mean. So it will pull the mean in towards that direction. Hopefully, I hope you, you get the idea. And I thank you for bringing that question because it can now be clearer. Here. It's now clearer here. When Let's maybe begin from a, a normal distribution. When you have a normally distributed data set, so let's agree it is bell-shaped like that. 
I don't know whether that is a bell shape, which is normally distributed. I want to let me see whether I can draw a better one. Yeah, so this is almost, this is normal. So this is a normal distribution. Assuming that um, the pass mark is uh, around maybe, assuming this is even 60%, that the students did relatively well. So the average is 60%. But then half of the people are below 50, 60, others are above 60, but they are in equal spread. So this is a normally normal distribution. There's no skewness. We have some form of symmetry. But the moment we have a positive skewness, when you have positively skewed data, what that means is that we have a few individuals who will pull the average in that positive direction. Meaning, uh, for positively skewed data, the median is likely to remain where it is. But because we have a few cases which are now pulling it to the right, we said that the mean is affected by those outliers, those extreme values. So it's the one that is pulling it to in that direction. So we call what we have what is called a positively skewed data, because now the mean will shift in that upward direct trend. So I think that that is why here I've now come, we've now clarified and said that the median can still remain the way it is, but because the data is skewed positively, a few observations will pull the mean from where it was in that direction. So we call this positively skewed. Please note that uh, skewness affects the mean. It, it may not affect necessarily the median. And I think we are okay on that. Thank you for the question, which has helped us to clarify things. So let's look at another example. And I think I was just thinking why uh, differently, but you always can think, you can always think in any other example. I do want to give the example of performance again, and where we have, everyone is doing, is, is, uh, we are doing well, but a few cases are performing badly. But think about maybe we have, uh, you want to pull together the stock prices, the stock prices of perhaps um, uh, companies in the financials, in the financial sector, in East and Central Africa. So the measurement is in US dollars. So you want to measure the average stock prices uh, for all the all the all the companies that are in the financial sector in the entire East and Central Africa, and then you find that you have a total of around. Uh, let's assume that we have five hundred companies. So it is likely that uh, depending on the year of uh, or rather the moment at which you are measuring this data set, you may find that the 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 data set which comprises the share price in dollars, because it must be converted in the same unit of measurement so that you can compare. It may happen that we have a few uh, companies which are not performing well. So if I selected the, the first, the best performing 500 organization, so we look at the best performing. So the best performing companies. So you are likely to have that kind of a, a situation where rather than just having a normal distribution such as that, you may want to look at the share price, which may be range from a certain level, maybe $10 to perhaps maybe $100. So because we're dealing with the best performing companies, then you are likely to have a skewed distribution in the sense that majority of the uh, data will be lying in on further to the right, something like that. So in this case, you will have now the median. You can have the median around there. And then perhaps now your mean, the average mark will come slightly below that. Because we're saying that if this was a normal distribution, the two should have been together the median and the mean should have been the same. But because we have a few 
companies which are not doing well or which are the lowest ranked in the, in the in the group it will pull the data set in that direction so this is the case of a negative skewed distribution so the importance of understanding the skewness and these all these ideas is even for your research let's now look at it in the context of research so uh, Cindy want to say something Question for Cindy. Your minute starts now. Yes, Doctor. Correct. Doctor, Please go mm -hmm. ahead. I'm a little I'm I'm a little bit confused here. Yes. Um I'm trying to, to think about the performance of students in the in a classroom. Yes. Where majority of the students performs well. Yeah. Uh, like they, they perform well. And then mm -hmm. you have less students who failed the exam. Correct. Does the mean, or oh, this is not, is this the average? The mean is the same as average, right? It's the average, yes, the average. Does does the mean grade increase or it reduces? It will reduce. It, because I'm tending, I'm tending to, to think if we have mm -hmm. majority of students who have performed well, the mean is likely to go higher. Mm-hmm. Okay. The mean grade is likely to go higher. When we have students, many students who have failed, the mean grade is likely to be lower. I agree with you entirely. You are very right up to that stage. Uh, so what it so, means is... Uh -huh, continue, Emma. Mm -hmm. Now, where, where I'm getting confused is where it's been called negatively, when the mean grade is it's supposed mm -hmm. to be higher and it's been called positively when the mean grade is supposed to be lower. <laughs> Okay, I, that is uh, something you've asked whether, why do we call negative positive? First yeah. things first, first when things first, about, yeah. uh, what, what, what we are doing is, is we want to understand the concentration. To what extent is the data set concentrated a lot? Where are they concentrated mostly? So if you have a, if you have a a, a a normal curve, a normal curve means your average, your average can be any number. Assuming your students are doing well, the mean grade or average is 65% or 70%. Let, let's call it 70%. Now, what it means is that that is your average mark. It doesn't matter whether it's 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 tending towards 100 or whatever, because your students have performed well, the average mark is 70. And if this forms a normal curve, what that means is that even though the average mark is 70, we have an equal number of students below and those ones above. This is a normal distribution. Equal number of students are below 70, the same applies to the other one above seven. We have equal numbers, meaning that the data is centered. It is, it is clustering around an average position of 70. Side that half of the observations fall below it and half of them are above it. That is a normal distribution. But the moment we know that in reality, this is not the case, there's always some form of skewness of some sort. Chances are very high that a few students or rather three quarters are above, and then the quarter will be below. So that is now where this concept of skewness coming in. We are asking in what direction is the data set clustered around? So if your students are doing very well, I would expect such a distribution. If you have very many of them going even be before above what, what you think is the average. If the average mark is still 70%, I want to believe, let's say it's, it's still 70%, but the performance is diverse in the classroom so that we have a majority which are who have passed 70. But there is a group that is pulling the average so, so strongly. So you can imagine if you have 85, 90, 85, but then you, in a group of uh, say 
uh, an average class of uh, say 60 students. You know, 60, in a group of 60 students, you can have 40 of them even doing very well. I don't dispute that the average will be okay, but now the problem is out of these 60, how many will come, will even score very poorly, even to the extent that they get below 10, 10 marks or 10%. These are the ones that have the potential to pull this average from the 70 to even something slow, lower. So the, this thing called negatively skewed, meaning that there is a tendency for a few extreme cases to pull it further to the left. That is why it's called skewness to the, in that direction. Because there, there will always be those cases where some, number, some, some students are underperforming, but even though you have the majority doing well. As a teacher, you will say, my students have done well on average because you have almost 40 to 50 students scoring around 70. But take note of the fact that out of these 60, the 10 of them, these 10 are the ones that, are pull, that will pull it, but it depends on to what extent they have they pull this mark down. So everyone will be happy that you have a very good class, they are doing very well, but nobody will notice that we have 10 students who have scored actually 5% or 10%. And those are the ones that will now pull this average from where it's supposed to be to somewhere below it. So skewness is a matter of in what way is the average pulling pulled? So in my case, it's pulled to the left. That's why it's called skewed to the left or negatively skewed is the same concept yes so i think we can get there so uh, jim is trying to uh, give it a narrative i think we are good let's get the details from maybe the recording or you can also double check from the literature but i like us to understand that we are not the same in a group these individuals that will pull down or pull up the others are the ones that now form the skew in but in what direction good i think that is a, an interesting discussion we're going to have even as we go along okay finally can i then proceed let's get the last question from brenda this will be the last one and then move to the next thing um it's actually not a question i just want to confirm if i'm actually understanding the whole skewness idea yes uh okay so you're saying if the tail as as jimmy is calling it is uh inclined towards the left then we are having a negative skewness right that's very right then if the tail is uh more inclined towards the right then we are having a positive uh skewness that's very correct. Yeah, okay. that's very right. So yeah. Is there a point whereby probably we have zero skewness? Correct. And that is now the point we call normal distribution or symmetry. This one. This is called the normal curve when there is no skewness. Everyone is, I mean, half of us are below, half of the rest are to the right. So this is like an ideal situation, normal distribution. When they say that in a society, you expect a normal distribution, a normal curve. You expect that, uh, well, half of us will be on this other side, the other half will be on the other side, so that at the end of it all, there is some form of asymmetry. So skewness of zero means that there is no positive, neither is there negative skewness in the data, the distribution. And it's the ideal situation. It's the ideal situation. Good. I think uh, we have exhausted that concept of skewness. But uh, just if you, read the, if you read the literature, when you see positively skewed, it also means skewed to the right. Skewed to the right because the tail is in that direction. When you see the skewed to the left, this is also what they mean. They mean negatively skewed because a few observations are pulling it in that direction. Now, let's me, let me show you another concept, which is also interesting for your, for, your, for your maybe knowledge. That one, what is written in red there? 
there's this concept called some will, will say ketosis, others will call it ketosis, depending on where this English you faith found you. All right, so uh, we are now talking about the extent to which the data is clustering around, or rather the picketness. How picket is the data? <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay i think uh, an interesting question for another day for ellen we'll talk about that in another forum <laughs> now but the question of uh, kurtosis is about the picketness or the flatness of the distribution i just want you to look at these four scenarios we have a green one here we have even the golden color very flat but it's still normal the red one almost mirrors this other one, but the, the, the peak level is a, a little lower. Yes, yeah, so this is about the pickedness or the positioning of the peak of the, of the data. So kutosis is an interesting one. You can have a normal distribution, but they seem to be so close to each other. I want you to think even in terms of your class marks, the average class marks for the students that you have. You may find that uh, the average, you have a normal distribution, yes. The performance is centered around 70%, but everyone is scoring around 65 and 75. So the data is so condensed that it's only two or three cases where you have 45, another one 90. But 90% of the data is of the students have scored the same, almost similar mark. So this is the blue line we're talking about. It is still normal, but the pickedness is so high and the data is centered. Then we have another one, the golden one, the extreme one. You know, the average is still 70, but the students are spread all over the, 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 the scale. We have a few 10s, 20, 30, 50, 80, 90, 100, even though the, the average is still around a certain amount. Yeah, so you can have that kind of a spread. So this is the interesting concept of the kurtosis, which I think you can be able to reflect on. Uh, now, the very final slide is, which, we, which we'll, uh, we'll explore in the next mm -hmm. segment, is um, the statistical measure of skewness referred to as the Pearson's coefficient of skewness. That's why you see in the graph that I have shown you here, you can see there are only two measures we are referring to, the median and the mean, the median and the mean, the gap between the two. How far um, is the distance between the mean and the median value? It can give an indication of the nature of skewness that you can generate or determine from a given data set. So the Carl Pearson developed this statistic to help us to gauge as to whether we have skewed data in or not in the data set, in the data set. So you only need three things. This X bar is the mean. You need to get the average of the data set. MD is the, is the median. So that gap between the two defines the median. And the down, down right there is the standard deviation, which we are going to consider in a, in a few. So the ratio between, the difference between mean and median multiplied by three, divided by the standard deviation from the data set gives you the extent to which you have either negative or positive skewed in the data set. So, so far we know how to compute mean. Um, it's possible to compute median, um, then the standard deviation as well is it is it, it's easy to show that. So with these three measures, you can then determine whether you have positive or negatively skewed data. Um, I want to ask a question, and I would I would like to uh, get an answer. I'm comparing the mean and the median. 
true or false? I'd like you to listen to that. True or false? Given the student marks in a class, if the average mark is above the median mark, I repeat, in a class that uh, Mr. X has been teaching, suppose the, me the mean mark, the average mark is greater than the median, then we can roughly conclude that the performance is skewed to the left. True or false? True. False. False. True, false. False. True, false. 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 True. Uh -huh. True. Yeah. All right. Good. Let's uh, let's get the because uh, they are on the oh let let's have the chat. Uh, let's have the feedback on the chat for everybody. And I would like to get everyone's response to that. I'm repeating for the sake of those who had were who didn't get it right. <laughs> who didn't get it right. And I would like us to, if you want to revise your answer, you can do it in the chat. The question is a teacher who runs a class, of course, at the end of the semester computes and determines the, the performance of the students. This is a class of 60 students. He determines at the end of the term that the average mark in his lesson is above the median. So he concludes that this performance is skewed to the left. And I think we are now okay. Please let's have the answers. Okay. I tell All right. You for me. I uh, okay. okay. Let me I, I repeat, this is a final call yeah. that uh, this, uh, this uh, the what? teacher has 60 percent. So let me just mute some people here. A, a teacher has 60 students in his class. At the end of the term, he computes the average mark, which is my X bar. He also determines the median mark. And he observes that the average mark is higher than the median mark. So he quickly rushes to a conclusion that the performance is skewed to the left. So I'm asking is the teacher's statements true or false? Okay. It looks like uh, the trend is forming now. Okay, we've been having false, 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 false. Now we have a few truths. Um, I know a few people are also changing their mind. Now the final 10 seconds and then we, we close the poll. Five, four, three, two, and one, zero. Good. Lisa, let's, let's now get it right. Some of us are writing, actually, the teacher, the teacher has, is wrong for the first time. <laughs> okay, good. Now, uh, the answer is as most of you have indicated. We say that, uh, well, when the performance, the average mark is higher than the median mark, you should know that that means that the, the, this sign there indicates positive, of course. You can simply determine that. Eh? When the median, when the mean exceeds the median. In other words, from what we had, the graph I had just shown you earlier, the average mark is higher than the median mark. So we are here. So the teacher actually made a wrong conclusion that
this it should have actually been a positive skewed distribution. Perfect. Good. Now that I think with that with that quick one, you have all understood the idea behind the skewness. So the last question here is this measure called the Pearson skewness of of coefficient of um the Pearson coefficient of skewness. You can determine it by and by solving the median and the mean, and then also solving the standard deviation. And then from that one, you can then determine whether you have skewness in whichever direction. So the sign can be a good determinant. If the number is so close to zero, and Mark Q, if the number is close to zero, you can as well roughly give an indication that seems to almost fit a normal distribution. So at times you can get 0 0.005. One can roughly in determine that this could be as well be a case of near normal. Please know that it's very difficult to get a value of zero unless the data is actually symmetrical. But in a normal setup, it's very unlikely. I like you at your, at some point, you can get some normal data, any data for your choice. You can use the Excel functionalities that are inbuilt to determine these indicators. You can always determine the median, the mid and the standard deviation. Simply going to the equal sign, you type average, you get the average mark for the distribution, select the data. And then the other one, you can also do the median and you can also do the standard deviation. And then from there, you can just calculate it. Normal. So it's possible to do it uh, efficiently using the software, but it's always good to get to know the, the mechanics of solving uh, some of these things. And I think that is what we have in this conclusion in here. This Pearson coefficient of skewness helps you to make certain conclusions. Um, it tells you about the direction. If the value almost closes, is almost to zero or equal to zero, it suggests that the data is symmetrical. Otherwise, a large number that suggests a large negative will also imply that it's a negative skewed distribution and the like. So allow me to introduce, because we need to solve one of the questions that some of, uh, someone asked that we do. Um, it can only be done when I perhaps introduce some concepts in uh, under variance or other measures of variation. Measures of variation. I'm going to put up the slides for the next section. Let me let me give you a minute to breathe. Let's take a minute or two. Let's have two minutes to just uh, grab a glass of water. Strictly two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Is, That's what. Is, Dr. Yes. Is it possible for us to? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry for taking you back. You know, I I was caught up in the rain on <laughs> Mombasa Road. So that mm -hmm. question number one: Did you solve it? Did you solve it with the clutch? The distribution question. Is it possible to solve by hand or what? No, I'm saying, did you solve it with the class? The question number no, one. No, 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 no we didn't. We haven't. We, we will. No, we just for the question. We only. I just we gave an highlight of the question that, that I gave you, but the one we have agreed to do is three. We'll do three together. Excuse me, Doctor. Yes, please come again. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, unmute yourself again. I'm saying. Yes. I'm I'm asking you to kindly go to the last slide. I was putting down something. Oh, great. Sorry, sorry about that. There you go. Yeah, there, there.
Yes, can are we back? Can I have some uh, answer for something? Yes, just let me see whether we are back to class. We are back, Doc. I think we are good. And then Gage. Good, thank you. Let's let's proceed to session two for the session today. I'd like us to just introduce the next concept. Uh, yeah, I have emphasized a lot about the average um, for for good reasons, because I know that for sure the average tells you one side of the story, but this idea of variability is even more critical. And I would like us at the end of it all interpret, no one how to interpret variation or variability or spread in any given data set. It might be important to just know whether your class performed well whether you have a high mean score of 70% or 80%, or everyone has, an, on average, a, a C stand or a C plus. That is useful information, but it can only be made better if we understand the variation within the data set. You have a class of 60 students. You've assessed their performance in a statistics uh, assess assignment. You find that they've all gotten, an, uh, there's an average mark of uh, 75%. If that is your average mark of 75%, it is good business, it's good information for the teacher. Everyone will be happy that the average is 75. But the question you will ask, within this group of 60 students, how is each of them performing relative to the 75%? How far is each student's mark far away from this 75%. Are all the students getting marks closer to 75? Do we have so many of them around 90%? You can have actually, uh, from the group of 60, you can even have 40 students getting 85 and above. And then there's a group of 20, that are not near 75, they are operating in the 20s and the 30s. So much as the average looks very impressive, but you will care about the degree of variation that we see within each of the observations. That have. So the measure of variance come in handy. It will now augment, it will now boost your knowledge about the understanding the characteristics of your individuals. So when you go to the field, you have your research, which has been formulated, crafted. You have a research questionnaire, a tool. You ask your respondents or uh, several questions, for example, on customer satisfaction. They tell you, can you rate, rate it on a scale of one to five? Uh, rate the extent to which you are satisfied with our service. You can have a very good rating. Uh, everyone is giving a rating of four, three, four, and three, a few 2.5, one, five, so that on average, you are on a scale of 4.12. If that is your rating, average 4.12, it is good, it is nice, but we want to understand, within the average of 4.12, are there a few fives? Are there a few 4.5s? Is there someone that has given you a rating of one, another one, 1 1.8, and the rest, or two? So that we now assess the extent to which there is variation in your respondents. So variance and standard deviations and coefficient of variation are the most preferable tools of assessing the extent to which there is variation or this uh, difference in the way we're looking at it. Variances, standard deviation coefficient of variations have a very important implication, especially if you are, for, for most of us who are in, in, in the education sector, you it will now tell you the true picture of your class. Because you, not, you want to now say that even though the average is very impressive, I see as very heavy variation in understanding the unit. You can, maybe the average is high because 10 people have pulled it up but the majority are down there. So it will now tell you as a teacher, you are not doing well in real terms. 
but on face value, you are okay. So, and the determination of these measures are very important. So I'll just make a mention of these two in passing, but I will just project the significance of the last three. Um, I think everyone understands what the range is, that you only consider the extreme values, the highest and the lowest. And these are very weak. It's a very weak measure of uh, variation because it only identifies two uh, values. It uses only two values in the data set. It doesn't make use of everyone else's. And so it can be very misleading that there's a very small range, you know, or a very big range because there's only one person who scored 10 percent and there's only one person who scored 90 percent. So the range is 80 percent because that's the difference. Meanwhile, when you look at the actual data, we have majority of the people are around 65 to 70. So it will mislead, it's a misleading uh, idea, but it's still very useful though in certain contexts where you, where you just want to interest in a very quick value, high and low. The reason why we do range at times is because you want to identify whether these extreme numbers, are they the true numbers or maybe you made a mistake in the entries so when they tell you, when you take when you collect data from your questionnaire, they will tell you tell them, well, if this was a financial institution, for example, you tell them how many new products did you uh, develop in the last one one quarter? If you find someone has recorded 300, and then you look at the others, they are playing around 10, 5, 3, and the rest then you begin to question whether this 300 was a genuine 300 or it was a mistake. Maybe the person wanted to indicate 30, but they write they wrote 300 by mistake. So at times, it's a good way of just picking out any strange numbers or strange data set within your given um, uh, maybe sample or responses. We have another one referred to as the interquartile range. This also has a weakness because it is a it tells you that you you need to first of all sort your data from maybe in an ascending order, and then you you divide them into four equal parts. The graph here is the one that shows you. I've arranged the marks for the students from the lowest mark to the highest mark, and then I can now divide these marks into four different re regions: the first quarter, the second, and the third, and maybe the last one. So this interquartile range just simply uses the middle numbers, the middle quarters here. It tells you what is the difference between the lowest quarter and the highest quarter three. So this that is what it just one of those measures. It ignores those other extreme extreme ones and then utilizes these two. So it's simply Q3 minus Q1. Very basic. Um, it's not very useful measure as well, just like the other one. Um, just like the range because it only uses two of the values. It's not very useful. You want a measure that will encompass everything, and that is more informative. And by the way, on the last note in here, if you've arranged your data in that ascending order, this Q2 value you get here is simply the median. It is a median value, just same thing. So the second quarter value is simply the median. Then, um. Depending on whether you have grouped data or ungrouped data, there's a, there's a technique that, or rather a process of just determining the same. Now, it now tells you, for, for example, here, 25% of the data is lying in the first quarter. The next 50%, the next 75%, and then the 100%. It's just a way of, of uh, simply splitting the data set into four equal parts. Um, I want to challenge. I want you to challenge yourself on the mechanics of computation of these quartiles, or these uh, quarters. Of these quartiles, there are th actually three of them. You do the Q1, Q2, and Q3. If you want to determine this mechanically or by hand, I have a, I've posed a question for you, and I've given you the mechanical way of doing it if the data set has been grouped into frequency tables. We look at it at some point. If time allows, I'll be able to guide you on the same. But let's take note of the fact that uh, 
from any given data set, from any given data set, you can identify certain classifications of this data. Like the one that I have just given you, the one that we're going to just work on before we conclude the session today, this one, this question three, it talks about the, the marks uh, attained or obtained by a group of students in a very large class. The marks ranges from 30 to 99, assuming this was the performance, nobody scored below 30. So there were seven of them in between the 30s, eight one between the 40s, up to the last one. So you can simply determine even the median mark. You can determine the lowest quarter. It gives you, I mean, if this data was arranged in ascending order, what will be the uh, median mark? What will be the lowest, I mean, the Q1, the, the first quadrant, the first quadrant? At what position are we locating that? So it's possible to do it from a, when you have a grouped data. So what it what what that basically means is uh, as you look at just want to move to the slides. So you need to identify mechanically th these quantities in any given data set. So when I say this is uh, this lower value here represents the lowest limit of the of the quarter high class. I think uh, let's let me leave this question for for the latter exercise until maybe when we do that question three, and perhaps I'll, I'll guide you on what you need to incorporate when it comes to application of this formula. So, but this represents the lowest, the, the lower limit of the QI class. QI means if it is a, a, a group of 100 students and you are doing Q1, you are looking for Q1 from a group of 100, you know the first quarter is 25. So I need to identify this 25, which class is this in the distribution? So I pick the lowest value in that category. There's a, an, a fraction there called I over four. I now represents which quarter are you looking for? Are you looking for Q1? If it's Q1, you, then I becomes one. If it's Q2, I becomes two. If you're looking for Q3, then I becomes three. So this is the formula that you use for all the Qs. The N is the number of observations, the total number of individuals in that unit. In our example, I just gave you the 100 students. Then there's a capital F right in here. It is the cumulative, this cumulative frequency of the class just above the lower, the, the one where the hell is. It is a cumulative frequency of the class above it. And then we have the frequency, which is now the, the total number of cases in this particular class. It will be clearer with an example, and then the C there is the class width or the interval. So mechanically, you can determine that. You can determine that with an, with an example. But later, we'll look at it when time allows. Then uh, there's an alternative measure of the interquartile range referred to as a quartile deviation. The difference between this is very small. The only difference you do is that it, this is divided by two. It's half of the distance. Because you're saying that deviation is simply Q3, or interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. But our width gives you the deviation. So it's just one of the measures to reduce that, that variance. Because when you, when you say Q3 minus Q1, it can be a very big number. But just to manage the size, you could consider half of it. This is one of those techniques that have just been developed. Okay, let me take you to the one that I wanted to us to look at today. I'm going to skip this one. This is a question for us to look at later on to compute in the quartile range and the deviations. I'm going to talk about variance and standard deviations. They are looked at together. So basically the, the two are one and the same because one is a, it is a square root of the other. So variance is basically the average squared deviations of each observation from the mean. I don't know whether that English makes sense to you. It's heavy English words, a mixture of things. Uh, by the moment you realize that uh, we are dealing with deviation, first of all, we let's pick the answer, the concept of deviation. Deviation means 
how different is is my score from the average that is the deviation uh, let me refer you to the example i talked about earlier and then we come to the example in the question three i have 100 students in my class The average mark they gave me in my ex in my exam is sixty five percent, and so I have hundred students. So I want to ask if I was to list them one by one, up to one hundred, I record their marks. So one person gets thirty, another one eighty, another one ninety five, another one four, another one twenty. Another one seventy. So this deviation now represents the gap between each observation and sixty-five. So the reason why we consider that is we are now looking at variation from the average. How far are you from the average position? And because some are above seventy sixty-five and some are below, then it's very likely that. Uh, 30, for example, will give you a negative deviation. 80 will give me a positive. 95 gives me a positive. This one is a very large negative, another negative, another positive. So by the time you look at all these deviations, it's a mixture of negative and positive numbers. Such that if I am to total them, if I sum all of this, you'll get zero. Because Ordinarily, the negatives and the positives can cancel each other along the way. And that is why now we bring in this thing called squared to take care of these negative ones and also to ensure that my summation will not become zero. So when you look at the concept of variance, it is simply the average of those squared deviations. So when I've deviated them, squared them, I look at the average. And that is what it's called variance. It now tells you that on average, how far is everyone from the mean? Good. So if you look at the formula right in here, it's now very easy to understand. I'm taking the case for grouped data. When the data is grouped, or rather ungrouped, sorry, it means that you have very few cases, 20 20 students in a class, 15 students in a class. So it's very easy to do that. So before I go further, um, Cindy, please let us know what you think. Yes, yes, Dr. Tari. There mm -hmm. is uh, this question, question one, that you had told us to calculate. Okay. Um, yeah, the first question that you had given us, Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, but he was asking us to look for to calculate the variance. Mm -hmm, correct. I, but so does, does that, yes, does that mean now to get the variance, we were supposed to get the summation of the x squared out of the number, then you yes. minus the square of the mean? Square of out the, of you know, the number. No, 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 no. First of all, you get the mean, uh -huh. right? You must get the average first. Then from the average, yes, yes, yes. you now look at every case is every, how far is 48 different from the mean. So you minus you minus uh, the average from each and every number you see in there. So that, the, that, the mean, the mean yes. is a summation of the fx out of summation of yeah. f, right? Yes. So that is the average. The average. Mm, I think we can, is it possible we do the, the question three? Then uh, from the three, you can now go back to one. At least having, okay, okay. In, yeah, it, there it will be easier and it will be easier for everyone. Good, so that we understand how you pro the process of getting the mean and then from there you got the, the standard deviation and the error and the, and the variance. Variance and then standard deviation. Yeah, so I hold that question for you so that you can look at it later on. But I wanted you to understand this formula which I've put in here. 
if the data is like the one I gave you in question one, which was not grouped, although this will be a little, those are a bit, these are quite many. Uh, although in part question B, if question one asks you to prepare the frequency distribution table, but that is that is possible. We'll work with the group data for now. So here, this idea you of like you, yes, please. You, 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 you explain. Okay, are you there? I'm sorry, I'm having a little myself by mistake. I'm saying n is here and n is the overall, which is, is expressed over the n, and I'm seeing the same n here, which means this is 100, and then you have 100, and you have 100 here, which is your, your computer denominator. Correct, yes. So does it mean that between summation, you have to have this, and then you come here and do this uh, calculation? Okay, this n is the same as the summation of f frequency, what you're saying, or the total number of observations. I think that is that your question, the n is 100 in each case. Did I, did I, I hope I have made it clear. That, that, that's still that's the fine. summation. That's fine. Yeah. I think that's fine. But I wanted to just explain this formula in respect to the concept that we consider first of all the mean x bar, which is the average mark. The average mark is 65. I now say xi. xi is each and every mark, the mark for individual i, where individual i ranges from 1 to 100. I now look at the difference between each one of them minus the 65. And because I said that there will be a mixture of positive and negative numbers, we must square it. Once you square them, then those negatives to drop out, what you will get is, an, is a positive number. From there, you can now sum, which is total of those numbers, and then you divide by the number of individuals. So this is where you have data which is not good. In most cases, if you have a few observations, the better. But in the event that your data is grouped, sorry, I think I need to change this one. Sorry, this is grouped. if you have frequency distribution table, the one that you did last week. So the only difference is that for every class, for every difference, you must multiply by the corresponding frequency. That is the only difference. That is the only difference. So having said that, I hope the formula is clear now. It is consistent with what we have given in here. So this is the case where you have large population. You know, when your population is quite large, you know, then we, in, in statistics, we, we are very conservative and very cautious with dealing with what is called population and what is called a sample. We've got a sample. So the, when you have very few cases, like you have students less than 10, less than 20 and the like, then the difference in this formula is the fact that now you know, you not calculate what is called a population variance, you now compute what is called a sample variance. When n is small, when you have very few cases, it means that you are not likely to deal, you, you get an accurate measure for the population. You are just using the sample to infer what the population is. So the same formula will apply, but there will, there will be an adjustment on the number of observations. So in the next slide, I've given you the formula that can apply for sample. So when you have this when you have small number of observations in your data set, the difference now is instead of dividing by n, you divide by n minus one. And I'm going to give you why, I'm going to tell you why we do that. The, the reason is because when you take a small sample, when you take maybe 14 students, and then you have this bigger pool of students in the old uh, in the whole region, county, for example. This is a statistics, cla statistics class. You've picked 14 students. In the, in the old university, maybe you have everyone doing statistics and you have over 1,000, over 5,000 students. So this number that you get from here, the, the average you get from 14 is likely to have some bias. Is likely to be it may not reflect the true value of the population. So what happens is that instead of dividing it by 14, we divide it by 13. 
so that you can correct for any biases that you are likely to get from very small samples. So whenever you see n minus one, it is not, it is because the, the numbers that, that you're working with there could be considered small in itself. And so it's possible to apply. They will be very small. Maybe you get the difference will be something very small. The formula you get from the sample, the other one will be, it's somehow a little bit different, but not very significant. But it's, this will now be a true reflection of that. Typically in, before I go to your question from Amici, typically in statistics, um, when N is less than 30, no. Yeah. When you have N less than 30 in a, in a typical statistics uh, situation in data collection and the rest, this is considered small in, an, in, in many cases. So it is good practice actually, when you're not very sure about the population behavior, it might be a very good idea to just reduce the bias by dividing by N minus one. Even in some cases where you have more than 30, 40, 50 cases, there's nothing wrong if you adjusted the sample by reducing by one, because you're simply saying that, I don't know the behavior of the population. And to, uh, to eliminate any biases, you let you just divide it by one. You you less by one. Sorry. So this is a matter of uh, this is statistics, but you could just work with numbers, or you can work with less than. I mean, let's work with numbers less than thirty. It will be clearer when you do hypothesis testing why this thirty is referred to in statistics. So for those who want to do a little bit more of research, I would like you to go and read. Just the concept of what is called central limit theorem. Central limit theorem is a statistical concept that whenever you have a small sample size, you are likely to have a bias. But as your sample size increases, as you now collect data from um, the bigger population or rather increase the sample size, then uh, you are likely to tend towards achieving what we spoken earlier, normal distribution. Anything less than 30, definitely you are not going to have a normal distribution. So, but as you increase the sample size, the, the, the statistical properties of normality is likely to be achieved. And that's why this number 30 is often referred to. So I encourage you just type Google or whatever find information about the central limit theorem, which I think we mentioned at some point. But it might be good practice always in most cases, when your sample size is considered small, in quotes, just lower that by n minus by minus by one. Good. Please know that the variance. Uh, sorry, I think uh, this the variance is still computed in the same way. If I take the square root of the variance, you get the standard deviation. I hope that one everyone knows. Whether the sample or population. You simply get whatever you get there, you divide, you take the square root, it will now give you the same measure. The difference is simply that the number you get in a standard deviation is you are reducing the magnitude of your solution. I think, yeah, let me see before I yeah, proceed with your question, before I proceed further. Yes, I'm just looking at the table you have here, or rather the values you have. Huh? Mm -hmm. And... Uh... The two formula you've given, one, the first one is ungrouped data. Mm -hmm. Should the second one be grouped data? Yes, please. Yes, yeah. I think I'll, yeah, I said I will make the adjustment in, before I upload the slides. Okay. Thank you. This is good. Thank you, DC, for that. Okay. JD, right. It's for grouped data. Thank you. So I was just saying that whether, whether you're doing a variance or standard deviation, it doesn't matter which one it is, because they all mean the same thing. You interpret it in the same way. Um, for standard deviation, a large value, when the value is high, when the standard deviation is considered large, it means that there's a large variation in your, sample, in your, in your, in your data. When the sample is small, or rather when the standard deviation is small, it suggests to you that you have a very, you have less variability. Let me give you an example now. 
in in the education sector you have um you, you have two 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 schools uh in two different counties you want to compare the performance in the English language for the fourth form for, uh, or rather the grade, let's say grade, grade 10 students, how they perform in English language. So you want to assess in the first school, which has 120 students in County A. In County B, there's another school which has 200 students. They do their English exam or the tests, and you look at their performance. So it's one thing to consider the average mark. Suppose in each case, the average mark in the school in County A is 72%. In, in the school B, we also have a similar average score of 72%. It is very likely to just conclude it there and say, well, the two schools performed very well or fairly well, and they have equal performance. That is what the average will tell you, the mean. But beyond the mean, I would like to understand what is the standard deviation, or rather variance for that matter. I'll ask myself, even though the schools performed equally, but how is the performance of each student in every school? So the, the, the school that gives you a smaller variance or a smaller standard deviation, it will mean something different. Let me give an example. Suppose in the first school, which, which was in County A, the standard deviation is 3.45 marks. In, in the second school of 200 students in County B, suppose the, the, the standard deviation is 6.25, meaning this lower variation in performance, student performance in County A school compared to B. That can now give some meaning and one can actually say it seems there is almost equal, there is a significant variation in performance among students in County B than in A. So much as the average is the same, it seems in the County B where we have a higher variance or a higher standard deviation, the students are not performing equally the same. There, is some, there could be some variation. Some are performing better than the others. But this other one, which has a lower variance, 3.45 of standard deviation, it tells you that even though the average is the same, there's some way in which the students are understanding the language in the same way, because the variation is not so high. So in other words, standard deviation variance helps you in terms of compa comparing, comparing uh, between cases, particularly where the mean is not giving you a a very good clear indication or even where there is a when even if there is a difference in the averages you can as well compare it in terms of the variability so that is what it is this is why i wanted to project the insignificance of variance and standard division in, in your analysis case number two we will at some point do research most of you will collect primary data from schools, from counties, depending on your study, study area. If you want to ask your respondents to rate or assay, tell us how you, uh, I mean, to what extent are you satisfied with the management of your institution on a scale of one to five, where well, five is, who uh, very satisfied. It is very easy to say that, well, the teachers are equally, are equally satisfied. But when I have a measure of standard deviation, it will now tell you that even though there's an overall 
uh, good satisfaction levels. There is a significant difference among the st among the staff on how they rate the performance of the management. So that is something that can be something for a policymaker to reflect and say, what are these cases saying? If the deviation is in most cases, if you want, if you want to give, let me give you now the proper uh, the the proper way of interpreting these numbers. Because it's a standard deviation, the cutoff point is usually one, one standard deviation. So even when you do your research, you do all these things, the averages, they give you the average mean. In uh, in uh, good, so good statistical software will also give you the standard deviations among the respondents. And in most cases, the cutoff point is one, one standard deviation. So when, when the standard deviation is below one, it tells you that there's less variation. If the standard deviation is above one, it tells you there's a high variation among the respondents. So this is why this standard deviation is a useful measure. If in both cases there are more than one, of course you can say that there's high variation, but in one case it's higher than the other. So there's always some story to be spoken about when it comes to these variations and standard deviations. Good. Allow me then we move to the question. Move to the question three with the time that is left. Uh, then even as you go to punch things in Excel, it's always useful to uh, work around the problem by hand so that we understand the idea behind what standard deviation is. You can never get the meaning unless you work it out. I'm projecting this question as among the last things I'm going to be doing. Let me just uh, make you the question itself. So this question, you have it somewhere, please uh, uh, put it somewhere. Uh, want to just walk it around together. Allow me to just, uh, let me just take, just give me, a, give me a minute as I just, let me do some things in terms of the organization for this question. Moment. So, so anyway, just let me let me just save save on time. Let me not try. Let's just let's just address the question right here. You can get hold of your paper. I want you to arrange this in a in a column. Sorry, my computer is trying to talk something else. I want to copy this in this format. So if you can, if you can. So if you can just let's let's let me just uh, copy this question right in here manually. Unfortunately, that is what you do so that you can demonstrate. Okay, so we have the first class. So I'm putting that to thirty nine. Uh, let's have to 49. Let's have 59. I'm skipping the other ones, but uh, 69, 
So please kindly mute if you are not uh, on, you are not speaking. So let me just, uh, let's just do it very quickly. So let's have seven, let's have E81, let's have 192, 312, 18, 82, and finally 18. I want someone to do the sum very quickly of those frequencies. How many students are there in total? So this becomes frequencies. I did it, it was 910, but let me just calculate it again. Yeah, someone 910. I'm picking 910. 910. Good. So this we should get as a 910 as a total. Correct. Thank you for those. Respondents, responses. Now, I'd like you to do the averages. The ones I call XI. The averages are simply the, the, the distance between 30 and 39, 40 and 49, and the rest. Let's have those. Let's have those uh, averages. Just say 39 plus 30 divided by 2. That will be the average class size. 34.5. So let's have 34.5. 34.5. Good. 55. 54.5. 65.5. No, 64.5. 54.5. You're adding 10. You added yeah. 10 in each. So it should be it should be eight four point five and finally nine ninety four point five. So this is what we call X I. In other words, for each class, what is the average for each class? So before we proceed with the variance and standard deviation, it's always good to get the average. So the mean. So first thing, first things first. The mean, which I'm going to call X bar, will be the summation of the mean of Xi divided by the summation of N. Let's, let's just call it N. Or you want to call it summation of N. Summation of F, sorry. So let's put in the difference. Yeah, let's now multiply F multiplied by Xi. So we can do the, the, first, the first one is two, it's 241.5. Then the next one is 3604.5. The other one is 10464. Then 2124. Uh, 1641. 16,000, yes. 241. 241. Correct. 82 times. Then, one. then mm -hmm. 69, 20, 69, 29. And then, then 17. 17. 17. Okay, there's no 0.5. So this is the, uh, simply the multiplication of F and X across each class. Then I uh, think from where you can get now, you can get the summation very quickly. Now let's have the, the for that. 59, the, 3, 3, or 5. Good. So I hope we're getting the process, the, sum, the multiplication of each of them times that. So this is not uh, very complicated. I now divide by 910. For this one, we can roughly assume that this is a large sample. So we can basically go with N. So if some sample are smaller in relative terms, you can as well divide by 
nine or nine if this was a small sample but let's assume like i said it may not be very big difference it's just we are very small little points here and there so what is the average mark 65.17 like that point Seven, one, good. So assuming this was percentage, that is what it is. Let's for the sake of um for the sake of the computation of the variance, let's determine the standard deviation. Let's now determine the standard deviation. Let's determine the standard deviation because it's grouped data. I'll now consider that standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance, where the square root of the variance is simply the, the, the average of the squared deviations of each observation from the mean. That's where we are. So first things first, um, the, let's do variance which is simply, okay, from what we have already gotten from the formula, we need to summation, we need to get the summation of the frequencies multiplied by every observation minus the mean. And because this gap here is a, it's a mixture of positive and negative numbers, so that when I sum them, it becomes zero. So that is why we must square it to take out the negatives and then you divide by the n. This is the formula that we had shown you earlier. Good, now, for now, um, for ease of computation, um, let's um, round off the x bar to become 65. For ease of, of computation, so we are going to use 65 because you got 65.17. So we can simply say that 65. So what it means now in the next step is we want to get this gap. Let's get deviation of each observation. After that, we multiply by the frequency in the corresponding class. Well, so that is what, yeah. So we want to create that column for xi minus the x bar. Good. Please note that the xi is this class in here. I'm now divide, I'm subtracting each of them from, or rather I'm subtracting 65 from each of these. What is the first one? 34.5 minus 65. Negative 30.5. Negative 35. Next one, negative 20. Yeah, negative 20.5. I want to believe it's a negative 10.4. I'm subtracting six, this one yeah. minus 65. This one minus 65 is negative 0 0.5. That, let's proceed. This is nine. This one, nine. nine. There has to be a nine. 9.5. Nine Please confirm that. Yeah. Correct. Next one. Hello? 84 minus, 84.5 minus 65. I want to believe it's 19. Point. Yes? 24.5. 24.5. Is that correct? No. It is 19.5. It is 19.5. Nineteen point five. Let's move on to the next one, the last one here. Twenty nine point five. Good. Yeah. Anything else? After you've computed this, what will be my next thing? I've. This, you square. We, yeah, now we now we need to square them. Yeah. 
please don't multiply this one first. You square it first. Let's square these numbers. So xi minus x bar, everything squared. Let's get what you get there. Okay, 30.5 squared. Please fill in that table. Nine thirty point two five. Nine thirty. Yes. Four hundred or four something. Twenty point five times twenty point five. Or twenty point two five. Ten point five. One ten point two five. Okay. Ninety point two five. Ninety point two five. Finally, the eighty point two five. Eight seventy point two five. Good. Final step. Final column you're preparing is the one that is simply a. We now multiply this by the frequencies. Xi minus X bar, everything squared. So please multiply whatever you got here by this 781 and the rest. I'm waiting for answers. Let's go with two decimal points. Six five one one point seven five. That is three forty forty point two five. Uh oh, come again three forty. Forty. And then another forty. Yes, point two five. To eleven six eight. Seventy eight. Can I move to the next? Is that true? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 21168. Yes, correct. Okay, let's move to the next one. A quarter of 312. Is... 78. Correct. For this one is that one. 218 times 90.5. 19674. 19674.5. 19674.5. We are then almost there. 31, 180. 31, 180.5. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. Add those characters from 6511 down south until 15664. 128317.5. 128317.5. Good. Now, from here, then you can do the take this number, take it to the computation of variance. 128317. So variance, let's call it sigma squared is equals to now. So 128. 128317.5. All of that divided by 910. You get a value of what? One forty one. One forty one point zero zero eight two four one eight.
Okay, so around one point one point zero zero point zero what? Zero zero. Okay, then leave it at one forty one. Now from here, our final conclusion, standard standard deviation. Yes. Is equals to or rather sigma square. See, let's call it sigma for consistency. And that should be the square root of sigma squared. So this gives the square root of 141. 7. 7. 8. 11, 11, 11. 7.11. 11. 11. 11.8. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. 11. So for, for, for a better interpretation, it will make sense to just, because it's a single data set, it just, it's important to just mention the characteristics and say that the mean mark, the average mark is 65% with a variance, with a standard deviation of 11.87. And because it's greater than one, it's an indicator that even though the average is 65, there's a significant variation, or, there, or rather there's high variation. Let's that, 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 not use the word significant. Never use significant in statistics anyhow. That's a concept for hypothesis testing. So don't use those words anyhow. You could just mention it and say, well, the average mark in this class is 65%. However, there's high variation in terms of performance across the students. And that is an in, a, a good summary. Because that's a good summary of doing it. So what that means is that now it can even make more sense if you picked another, another statistics class or another class and look at their mean and average and then you compare and tell us in which case is it better and the other. Good, any questions? Any other questions on this exercise? So I've introduced you to the concept of variation, standard deviation, and, okay. and it is an indicator that can help you to assess differences among people, much as you have the overall picture. So your take home, as we wrap up that session, Please go to the slides as your exercise for the week, weekly exercise. Can I, is there a question? Yes, 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 morning. Yes, it was. What would be considered the, the smallest deviation, for example? Mm. I think I, in most cases, I, I, I've already indicated that uh, in a typical situation, we often have a cutoff level of one percent of one. When it comes to now uh, hypothesis testing and the rest, or assessing significance, we usually assess whether the variation is greater than one or less. In this example, it will be very. It might be a bit difficult to pinpoint and indicate that because uh, it's it is eleven, it is still showing that it is high. Because someone will now say then high from what? Yet standard deviation doesn't have a limit. It can go as, it is actually a positive number starting from zero point something going up. In a typical situation, if the variance or if the standard deviation is less than one, it shows that there's very close, uh, the, 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 the numbers are very close to the average. Meaning for example, for this case, the class, the class seems to understand concepts. They perform equally likely. They are the same in terms of performance. But anything be, be, uh, higher than one, it can now indicate you that there's high variation. However, however, in most cases, you would want to compare cases, different 
different group from another one, which will be a typical case because you might, you're not likely to have very similar uh, students. You not hold different uh, the same views all the time. Typically, you will expect this variant standard deviation to be a, uh, a number more than one, and so it can give you more meaning if you have different context groups to compare. In this example, we've just looked at one case. And on its own, you can just mention that it seems that there's a higher variation higher than one. So it means that there's high variation, high variability in performance. But I would be very, it might not really have, it not be a very good way of looking at it if you only have one case. It gives you metas and understanding if you have more than one. And that's why I was giving you, I had told you that uh, this is your question for you to do for this week. Slide number 11. Um, like you to like you to look at this teacher who was assigned two streams of um two two classes to teach statistics stream A and stream B. This is the the, the marks given here are for stream A, how the students fared in a typical class marked out of 50. These are the scores. You are asked to use this to compute the average, you know, the standard deviation of this mark. Then you have been you're given the values for the other stream. He has done the work, and then these are the numbers for the other stream. So you ask, you asked, is there a difference in their performance? Given that this is the same teacher teaching two groups, what can you say about the performance in the two classes? Then now you can interrogate factors that can contribute to the divergence or other results that are, that are varying in the class. Good. I hope that is a good way of ending the session today with a question for you to go and look through. And this one is a solid one. Brenda? Uh, thank you so much, Doc. I think um, the math is mathing with us, but to Tajikaza. So I just wanted to know if we are maybe scheduled for any quizzes anytime soon. And if mm. possible, maybe you, you tell us in advance so that we we really get to uh, get squeeze it. ourselves and, yeah, and get to prepare. That was the, that is actually what was in my mind in the morning. But uh, what we would do is I have, a, I have, I think, I was just waiting for confirmation of um, some dates, which I'm likely to be making a presentation somewhere, but uh, if at all that is, uh, let, let's confirm this uh, in the course of next, uh, in next week's lesson. I'll tell you exactly when that is going to happen. It's very likely that uh, it can be either the 28th or the 6th. But uh, then in between, I will ask, I will, I will give you a date in advance that uh, if there's something that you do in class, like a question like this one, I'll be, I'll, I'll ask maybe a week in advance that the next week I'll we'll do the class, and then towards the end of the class you do a question. But the one that is going to be the official is uh, where you just come and walk around. Let's have two dates, either the 28th or the 6th of March. Those two dates, but subject to confirmation. Excuse me, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Bozzi. You are allowed. Yes. Yeah, the, 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 this assignment, the, the B, you have 34.5, 18.5. I mean, 18.56. Those are the extremes for the B uh, ring. No, this is uh, this is the average and the standard deviation. Oh, okay. The average, the mean is 34. The standard deviation is 18.56. Oh. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> <laughs> ah, good. So thank you. I think the the we have done business and we've done justice to the session. As we move now in going into the next week and the ones that are upcoming, 
we shall now elevate a little bit to hypothesis testing, the like. Good, we end here for now. I wish you well. Um, let's keep going. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Enjoy your evening. You too. You too. Bye-bye.